I think we can begin sharp at three o'clock. Really? Yes, madam. Yes. Okay, fine. Yeah, it's it's live, madam. Now. Okay. Mark sir, it was really uh, very nice of you to be there yesterday through the entire sessions, plenary one and plenary two. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. It was very good. Yeah. And You're and I think. I, I think uh, during a conference, a kind of uh, discourse develops during the conference. And so it helps if you're coming towards the end of a conference or in the middle to see it in context, you know, the sorts of lines of thought that have already been established. So uh, apart, from, apart from anything else, that's what I wanted to do, to understand what was being said in the conference generally. Absolutely. What you say is absolutely correct. The discourse develops gradually and by the end of the conference, you really know what it all was about. Yeah, you do. So, That's right. Yeah, I yeah, hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really a pleasure having you and uh, I felt really very nice. I told Dr. Nikam the same thing that uh, 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 Professor Mark was there throughout the sessions and was really graceful. Uh, thanks. Well, it was my pleasure. It's uh, it's an honour, and I'm I'm only sorry that we don't have the face-to-face um, -face ability to have question and answer, you know, and, and sort of Correct. get some discussion going. But I'm sure that will follow. I'm sure that will follow. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. We'll try our level best. Since this was also an experiment for us, uh, being the very yeah. first e-conference that we are holding, and we yeah. had more. Yeah. So. And the and the nice. The nice thing is that people make contacts and they follow up by WhatsApp or email or whatever, you know, so uh, it doesn't just stop at the end of the conference at all. Right. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Prakash, uh, my, um, my screen sharing, so when that will be all right. You know, we, we tested that before, but I'm assuming that's all going to be okay. You want to share it now, sir? Uh, maybe, yeah. I just uh, want to make sure that it's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Sir. Definitely, for a second, I make you a okay. host, so okay. you can uh, share it. Yes, sir, you can check now. Okay, yes, thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, we can see it. Okay, I'm just gonna try and, how do I get rid of, oh yeah, okay. Uh, not there, just stop sharing is option, at the top. At the top, stop sharing. No, but I, I'm just wondering how I get rid of the panel down the side. What can you see? Can you actually only see the slide? You can't see. Uh, you want, uh... You can just show. see you can just see the title with the dog and so on. Yes, we can see everything. Yes, yes see sir. We can see your entire screen as it is, sir. Oh, you can see my entire screen. So you can see yes. all the, the things down the side. I want to get rid of those. How do I yeah, do Yeah, we can see the slide. We can see all the slide one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like this. No, so how do I get rid of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? You eight, have nine? to you have to start slideshow, sir, then automatically that will oh. go. Okay, great. All right, terrific. No worries. Thank you. Yes. You just click here, sir. Stop sharing now. So stop sharing. Yes, sure. Yeah. No yeah. So okay. I will give you again that. Uh, yeah, gotcha. Fill the time. I just take the people inside the room and then I yeah. make you host. Of course. How many of them are already there in the room, Prakash? Like just a second, ma'am. Around 12 people are there, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am, 12 people. It means uh, for HARSO forum members and panelists, five. Okay, fine. So let me know when to proceed. At three, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta, you may start uh, at uh, three o'clock. As the schedule goes, okay. As per the schedule, uh, begin at three o'clock. 
Yes. Okay. Hello. Hello. Professor, did you say something to me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell me. No, madam. Yeah. It's three o'clock, ma'am. Shall we start, ma'am? Madhavi, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, please, please. Very good, good afternoon and a warm welcome to the second day of our two days international e-conference on environment, literature and culture organized by Higher Education and Research Society, founded by the President Dr. Sudhir Nikam sir and the Secretary Dr. Madhavi Nikam Nam. I, Dr. Sangeeta Kongre, on behalf of the Higher Education and Research Society, heartily welcome our today's eminent speakers for the plenary sessions and the valedictory address. I welcome our, all the participants from various states across India, as well as the globe, who have registered for this e-conference. Dear participants, we are glad to have with us the plenary session speakers, Dr. Mark McLeod from Australia and Dr. Zeklina Skrenti from Poland. And for valedictory address, we have Professor Jaydeep Sarangi from India. Dear participants, Let's proceed further. I'm honored to introduce our distinguished and stalwart speaker for today's first plenary session, that is Dr. Mark McLeod, sir. Dr. Mark, let me introduce sir first. Dr. Mark is an adjunct senior lecturer at Charles Stewart University in Vega Vega, Australia. Professor Mark is on the board of management at TAS Writers, that is the Writers Center in Hobart, Tasmania. He has taught, sorry, he has taught in, uh, he has taught children's literature, Australian literature and creative writing at universities in Australia and around the world, including various parts of India. He, he has taught in online workshops as well for writing New South Wales and the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Sir is the president and publishing director of independent publishing house, Dirt Lane Press. The publication house publishes for children and teens in partnership with publisher and editorial director, Margaret Lehman. Professor Mark's publishing career focuses on narrative texts as agent for change. He has been publishing director at Random House, publisher at Hashe Australia and freelance editor for publishers, including University of Queensland Press, Omnibus Books, ABC Books and Queer Inc. India. Professor Mark is well known for his commentary on books for young readers on television, radio and in print media as well. His current research interests are in LGBTIQ, narrative for young people, the awareness and teaching of social justice and the adaptation of children's sex. He is a former national president of the Children's Book Council of Australia. Dr. Mark has been honored with various awards for distinguished service to children's literature and for titles published under his own name imprint, Mark McLeod Books. For many years, he has been executive editor of the highly esteemed journals like International Research in Children's Literature, published by Edinburgh University. Sir has composed poems for adults and children and picture books, especially for kids. Sir, we are really honored to have you among with us today. With this exhaustive list of credentials, I now welcome our very vibrant and dynamic speaker, Professor Dr. Mark McLeod, to proceed for the plenary uh, talk on children's picture books, Wild Things in the City. I, am, I once again welcome you, sir, uh, for, our, uh, for our this conference plenary session. Please proceed to the virtual floor for the deliberation. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Namaste, Dostan. Aap kaise hain? Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I would like to acknowledge, first of all, that I am speaking from the lands, the traditional lands of the Munina people, 
um, on an island that we learned when I was growing up to call Tasmania, but which the traditional custodians call Lutruita. Uh, it's a very beautiful part of the world and a very beautiful part of Australia. Uh, I live near mountains and waterfalls and rivers and forests. And so it's um, a great honor. And I acknowledge the elders past, uh, present and emerging um, of this land. Uh, I think I should share my screen if Prakash can. Yeah, great, okay. Well, my title, Wild Things in the City, I hope um, is recognizable to you from the classic picture book, um, Where the Wild Things Are by Charles, uh, Maurice Sendak. And I've, so, as I was thinking about this uh, topic, Wild Things in the City, a conversation between children's books and the mercurial exhilarating rhetoric of Paul Virilio's thinking on speed and uh, catastrophe and perception called the University of Disaster, published in 2007, um, seems to be quite unexpected. In his text, Speed and the University of Disaster, Virilio denounces the contemporary appetite for speed in our society. He argues that catastrophe is its inevitable consequence and that the construction of realism by the camera has collapsed time and space and made human perception impossible without technology. For him, for Virilio, this makes agency impossible for the individual human. Only technology is in control. And I feel a little bit like that today. <laughs> when I first read The University of Disaster, I thought immediately of our obsessive measuring of Olympic uh, performance by 0.001 of a second. I mean, have you ever thought about that? That's crazy. To my eye, medalists who are separated by thousandths of a second appear to, be, to have tied, but the human eye has nothing to do with it. And in a broader perspective, that's the discourse that Virilio sets up in his book. Between the headlong rush towards catastrophe and the reverse thrust away from it to avoid collision. So, my topic today is to look at children's picture books as part of a potential reverse thrust. So are they actually a kind of retreat from um, modernity, from the contemporary, and a retreat back into um, romantic and sentimental notions of childhood as a time in the past and a, a childhood of the land itself? Um, or are they, in fact, uh, to be read in a different way as far more radical and challenging uh, some of our most deeply held uh, values. In 2020, a daily example of the anxiety that's inherent in this conversation is the clash between scientists who are pursuing the slow and methodical testing of potential COVID vaccines and the populist and politicised impatience of a consumer society that has learned it can have whatever it wants now by instant download or contact-free delivery. Although the environmental framing of COVID-19 has been mainly geopolitical, one trope that keeps appearing in photojournalist narratives is the clearing of the built environment. Variously in images of loss and grief at the absence of human traffic and commerce in the cities, or utopian visions of the Himalayas seen sharply from smog-free cities for the first time in a generation, or of canals in Venice, once again free of tourist garbage and reclaimed by dolphins. Sadly, at such times, such images have been fanciful inventions, but not always. You'll remember in Maurice Sendak's classic picture book, Where the Wild Things Are, that Max, a young child in his wolf suit, is sent to his room without any supper by a mother who overreacts to his playful threat to eat her up. As Max stews on the injustice of it all, the indoor plant in his bedroom grows into a jungle and he sails off to an island where he's welcomed by the grotesque and comic wild things and where he eventually becomes their king before he realizes that it's time to get back home where supper is waiting for him after all and it's still warm. 
The image of wild things in the built environment in children's picture books is both mischievous payback by gleeful children who, like animals, are marginalised by adults, and a utopian vision of what could be if only adults were willing to see things as children do. The last time I sat in Mumbai traffic, I, might, uh, I was thinking today, before lockdown, I was struck by the way that, and, and you'll see this as you'll see this as ordinary and normal, but to an outsider, it's quite exotic and quite fascinating. The way that a cow will be lazing away the morning on the sidewalk in the incredible traffic in Mumbai, or right across the middle of the road, lumbering through six lanes of honking cars, um, is a cow completely unhurried, just, just taking its time. And, and I observed that none of the drivers seem angry ever. And it seemed to me that this is a daily reminder for humans in such an environment of the possibility of calm in an otherwise stressful and insane built environment. I might be, I, I hope, well, maybe you'll think I am romanticizing life in India, um, but I'm always struck by the patience of the drivers of the autos. You know, nobody ever seems to get angry. I've only seen one example of what I would call road rage in all the times I've been in Mumbai, uh, which is quite remarkable. I've seen people nearly have complete collisions and still the driver just kind of shrugs and keeps on going. And I fancy to myself that that image of the calm of the, of the cow in the middle of the traffic um, is some kind of icon for that kind of uh, set of values. The city in picture books is constructed as an alien environment, as tall and loud and fast as the adults who created it, confusing and yet also temporarily alluring. In Deepa Balsavar's book, Nanny's Walk to the Park, Venki wants to accompany Nanny on her weekly walk, but Nanny warns him that she walks very slowly. Her slow pace is the key to the child's being able to feel comfortable rather than overwhelmed by the built environment. And as they walk, the reader identifies all the activities in progress around them. Now, if you compare briefly the construction of personal space in Balsavar's book with that of Martin Hanford's Where's Wally, there's a significant difference. Where's Wally is the image that you're looking at on your right. Where's Wally was a kind of hybrid of a traditional parlor game and what were known as the magic eye stereograms, which were very popular in the 1990s. You might have played with those yourself, some of you, um, as a test of the readers, the human readers ability to manipulate focus and see an image emerging from what appeared to be just random dots. The reader's job in Where's Wally is to identify that one red and white striped top that signifies the presence of Wally. The thousands of other people in the frame are irrelevant. They're like the distractions in a Donald Trump press conference. Distractions, rather. So the composition in Martin Hanford's Where's Wally is goal-focused. It's only Wally that matters. All the other people there are intended to block or trick the reader. By contrast, to be fair, the sense of space constructed in Nanny's Walk to the Park on the left of your screen is different. This is a neighborhood rather than a crowded city with people who wave at one another. But from the point of view of a child who doesn't go to get, get to go to the city very often, it's still very confusing. Although the range of activities is potentially disorienting, Nanny's slow pace in the walk makes it manageable. And as well, she's created imaginative names for each street she and Venki pass through. There's the lane of treasures, the lane of beauty, she points out the lane of happiness and so on. Then the final reveal is a huge fold out map inside the back cover, um, which brings together all the streets. Um, it kind of fits them together as, a, as pieces of a puzzle now seen in a single bird's eye view. Although the park is the ostensible goal of this journey, the walk itself is the narrative. And the pace, the naming, the use of metaphor to transform the environment along the way, empower the young reader. Early research findings into the impact of COVID-19 on children confirm what parents and teachers in the audience today know only too well. 
uh, a, the title of a, an article in 2020 published August this year in Psychology and Health is Struggling to Breathe, a Qualitative Study of Children's Wellbeing During Lockdown in Spain. And this study reports stress levels four times higher, 400% higher in children who've been quarantined than in children who have not. An increase in fear, an increase in sadness, increase in loneliness, sleep problems, bedwetting, weight gain, loss of cardiorespiratory fitness. There's a whole, a whole catalog of problems reported by children and their parents um, under the uh, restrictions of lockdown. Although some studies report that US respondents now spend 90% of their time indoors, for a range of reasons. And, and that figure is drawn from research that is pre-lockdown. So we're not talking about lockdown. I mean, it must be, well, I know it's not must be. I have friends in the United States who 100% of their time is spent indoors. Um, so 90% of their time in, indoors spent there for a range of reasons. The advantages of lockdown reported include more family time, increased use of and familiarity with technology, and sustained shared thinking between adults and children through episodes of play. When asked what they missed most, children cited, of course, friends, but contact with the sun, the air, and other natural elements and locations, such as mountains and parks. It's significant that the word that the children mention most frequently is the need to breathe. The publication in 2005 of Richard Louvre's book, Last Child in the Woods, gave a name to what these children are reporting, Nature Deficit Disorder. And research into the Scandinavian uh, model of the outdoor classroom, which for 40 years now has been influential in early childhood education around the world, identifies a range of benefits in cognitive and effective learning, the development of practical skills and social learning particularly clustering around the idea that learning in the outdoor classroom is so frequently child-centered and child-generated. And, you know, as we saw in Nanny's Walk in the Park, one of the keys to the child and, and a relationship with the environment is keen, close observation. But I included another image here, and that is of children uh, in the natural environment pursuing activities that are, have really nothing to do with nature itself. In this case, the enjoyment of music or painting or whatever. Um, in their study of the Finnish experience of the out outdoor classroom, Schoblom and Svens in 2019 point out that the negatives of learning in the natural environment are mostly reported by adults, not children. And those negatives reported by adults are health and safety risks. How boring that is. <laughs> Teachers' lack of confidence in managing the outdoor classroom and the costs of staff ratios involved. I mean, the list of adult complaints about the, the outdoor classroom is, as I say, predictable and quite tiresome. The alignment of the child and the child's well-being with the natural environment is part of the romantic tradition of constructing the child as innocent. That construction, though, can only be sustained by absence. By looking backwards from an adult perspective, childhood is the time when all the heavy responsibilities and consequences and grief of adult life are absent. As we try to understand why nostalgia has been such a powerful trope in children's picture books, it's important to remember that the production and consumption of children's books are determined by adults. Even in young adult fiction, one of the implied readers is always the adult. So the presence of the hidden adult, as Nodelman calls it, is inescapable at the younger end of the age range. In Sean Tan's book, Tales of the Inner City, one early scene is in conversation with speculative films such as Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Dwarfed by towering city buildings, a vast crowd of workers witnesses the arrival of a cloud of butterflies. 
Have these people assembled to observe this anticipated phenomenon? Does it catch them by surprise as they go about their business? I'm quoting now from page eight of Tales from the Inner City, Tales of the Inner City. Was this an omen of something good or bad? A plague? A system out of whack? A divine message? A lesson in chaos? What did it mean? What did it mean? Later, we would study photo and video evidence with furrowed brows, listen to media analysis, consult scripture and meteorology, look at maps, graphs, stats and bell curves. Later, we would worry. Well, the narrator here is clearly an adult and the natural phenomenon is to be not just observed, but to be interpreted. The narrative closes, however, with a reversion to the pre-rational in an attempt to reclaim the, the sensuous response of a child. And I'm quoting here at the end of the story, Butterflies uh, on page nine. But for now, for that briefest of all moments, we did not ask why. We thought of nothing but the butterflies, the butterflies settling on our heads, on the heads of friends and family, on everyone we knew and everyone we didn't on the whole city, all at once. Don't move, we whispered, wishing it could last forever. Hold still, hold still, hold still. The city environment, the vast numbers of people and the ongoing flight of the butterflies together mean that a single moment is the best that can be hoped for in that environment. But in Tan's picture book, Cicada, um, metamorphosis is seen as an individual um, procedure and, and longer lasting. Cicada is an office worker whose dispiriting routine leads him to climb up the Escher maze of stairways to the roof and launch himself from the top of the building. Tan addresses his own cross-cultural heritage in a brilliant rendering of a Creole narrative voice that synthesizes the ticking of time, the sound of an insect, and the construction of a narrator whose second language is English. I'm quoting here that from that uh, scene. Cicada work in tall building, data entry clerk, 17 year, no sick day, no mistake, talk, talk, talk. This Creole constructs Cicada as one of the colonized and childlike who is driven to live out his destiny and fly. And here's from later in the book, here he is climbing up that uh, Escher-like maze of stairs up to the top of the building and throwing himself off the top of the building. No work, no home, no money. Cicada go to top of tall building. Time to say goodbye. Talk, talk, talk. The power to transform the environment here consists literally in flight in being able to leave it all behind. There is optimism in these narratives, but it's so darkly shadowed that individual agency is compromised. To go back 50 years to Ezra Jack Keats might seem at first to be the sort of adult retreat into nostalgic constructions of childhood innocence that I was disparaging earlier. I mean, it's only adults who think childhood is a time of innocence and, and and people say, oh, don't ruin their childhood innocence. Let's keep them children. I mean, whenever politicians start to talk about childhood and the curriculum, they talk in those terms. You don't need to know very much about children or to be very close to them for, to realise that children experience most of the disruptive, um, the distressing, the, the grievous disruptions that, that adults have. Um, they know certainly about war, they know about loss, they know about best friends who turn into best enemies and so on. So to go back to a time 50 years ago when Ezra Jack Keats um, is portraying in the snowy day, 1962, um, children playing in a snow-covered Manhattan um, is seemingly to indulge in a kind of sentimentality about childhood. 
But in Keats's use of colour and texture to transform graffiti and garbage into what he calls the mosses and lichens of the urban forest, he celebrates the child's imagination. The snowy day transforms the streets, um, this, when, transforms the city streets with a blanket of snow and the children play in it and they remake their own images. When it melts, the world won't be returning to normal. It will be forever different, even if only in the imaginations of preschoolers. The US writer Roxane Gay made a searing comment recently on the society's obsession with getting back to normal. She said 30th of May, 2020 in the New York Times, the rest of the world yearns to get back to normal. For black people, normal is the very thing from which we yearn to be free. It's such a sobering comment um, when, I mean, every single hour of the day we hear people saying about COVID-19, I wish we could just get back to normal. She's saying, uh, we actually want to move on. <laughs> In Ezra Jack Keats's book, Dreams, 1975, it's a hot summer night, it's hard to get to sleep, and Roberto shows Amy a paper mouse that he's made in school. Amy's not as impressed as he had hoped, and she says merely, well, can it do anything? Deflated, Roberto says he doesn't know. But later that night, when he hears a kitten down in the alley being threatened by a dog, he leans out and accidentally knocks the mouse off the window ledge. As the mouse falls from the top of the building, it casts an enormous shadow that terrifies the dog, which clears out and saves the kitten. It's a wonderful image of the power of the individual child's imagination. In Kartik and Roy's A Walk with Tumbi, the narrator begins, I took Tumbi for a walk today. And as the walk goes on, they look, they listen, they smell the bazaar, they meet friends, they have a swim in the river, they get covered in mud, they do all the sorts of things that they've been told not to do. And when they get home, Amma is not thrilled and she says, you didn't listen to a word I said, did you, Tumbi? The narrator adds, then she turned to me and said, and you've had fun too, haven't you? It's an absolutely fabulous ending, a fabulous reveal, um, which can only really be predicted by noticing that stick in the, on the cover and in the early images. Um, a walk with Tambi, we instantly assume that Tambi is the dog and that the child is taking the dog for a walk. In fact, it's Tambi is the um, child and the dog is taking him for a walk. And that's only revealed at the end. So this flipping of the perspective is one answer to adults who turn to children's books, uh, picture books as a flight from complexity. So we've seen the reimagining of the environment, first through detailed observation of the actual and the transformation of the actual through the imagination, then the contesting of narrative voice and perspective. I want to direct you briefly now to the use of narrative medium and design in the reimagining of the environment. For some adult readers, collage, the collages of Australian artist Jeannie Baker appear to collapse time and space by returning them to the nature table of their childhood classroom. The response that so many adults make to these kinds of collages are a, a kind of sentimental, ah, oh, there's a kind of big sigh, a group sigh, where people wish that they could do that. And they think, oh, that's just like my nature table when I was a child. The sentimentality is only on the surface, however. Here in the book Belonging, Baker is confronting the issue of exponential urban development, deriving from a fundamental belief in the principle of human ownership of the land. Through the window, each page has the window, and we see what's happening from uh, month to month in it. Through the window, um, we see over time, this family redefine the idea of belonging. As they invite the natural environment into the urban wasteland in a restorative move, the narrative morphs from the idea of material possession as a belonging acquired by humans to the idea of humans belonging to the environment. Collage here is part of the language of childhood, but because Baker makes it clear that she only ever uses dead natural materials, and dyes and paints them to make them appear living, 
the medium itself is participating in the project of reimagining and restoring the power of the natural environment. In all these books, picture books for younger readers, I see the childlike imagination reclaiming and restoring. And despite the adults who demand to know which age group a book is for, or how I define children's literature, as I go, as I go on and get deeper and deeper into children's literature, it seems to me that childhood is frankly a way of seeing. It's got nothing to do with age. And it's fundamental to that way of seeing is the belief in possibility. Individual children, as I said earlier, experience loss and grief, fear, physical and emotional suffering, depression. But when the inner child survives in that child, it is because of a belief that no situation, however broken, is irretrievable. There are, of course, dreadful, abusive situations and traumas that children suffer, some of which end in the child's death, um, some of which end in a kind of living death, uh, from which possibility is very difficult to retrieve without many years of therapy. As you consider the role of metaphor in creating possibility, I urge you to read the book Pu um, by C.G. Salamander and Samita Gunjal. In Pu, the narrator's job is to harvest flowers. She says she hates everything about flowers, the smell, the feel, the fact that people laugh at her for her work and the fact that she has no friends. It's quickly apparent, even if it wasn't for the prompting by the title, that collecting flowers is a metaphor for harvesting human waste. So the story is narrated in code and the narrator shows no awareness of that. She says she doesn't know why people hate her and why she has no friends, even though there are flies buzzing around her body and there are pigs and dogs licking the flowers from, off her, from, from her legs as they uh, gather around her. So how are we to read this? Since she maintains the metaphor of flower harvesting to the conclusion, we, we, are, we ask ourselves, we're challenged in how are we to read this child as narrator? Is the implied reader an adult? who's being urged to create a world in which no child will have to dig through human excrement ever again. There is actually an author's note at the beginning of the book, the kind of thing that most children will skip over, uh, which alerts us to that. But otherwise, um, it seems that the child narrator is completely unaware of this. Are we to pity the child narrator who does not appear to see the true ugliness of the world she's fated to live in? To some extent, a reading like that is condescending as if we are adults talking over the child narrator's head? Or is the young reader being positioned to rescue the child narrator from her own naivety? Is the implicit call to action evidence of a belief in possibility? Finally, I want to draw your attention to the major development in Australian picture books over the past 30 years. And that is in picture books by First Nations writers and artists. Often deceptively simple, these books are radical in their demand that non-Indigenous readers reimagine their relationship with the land. In the book Nuntu Ninti by um, Uncle Bob Randall, which I don't have in the uh, slideshow that I can show you, it's a fabulous book. Nuntu Ninti, what you need to know is what that title means. When Uncle Bob Randall says in this book, us mob, we're from the desert. It's really hot where we come from really hot and really beautiful. You know, the directness of that statement is an absolute challenge to the colonizers' rejection of the climate and of the center of the Australian continent itself. I'm quoting later from uh, Newtoniti. As we walked over country, we didn't worry about building houses. You don't need a house when you're alive. You can move and you can leave it behind. The simplicity of the language here will appear naive to some adult readers, perhaps even embarrassing. But to me, its directness is a radical challenge to adult values that have allowed the devastation of the natural environment. I'm quoting again from Nyutininti, everything is ours, everything is family. No one is without when you think and live that way. Sometimes I wish all the people in the world could know this, then more people would smile. 
the thing I, I can never get over as Australia has sold so much of its land, so much of its soil and resources to steel manufacturers in China and elsewhere. The land in Australia to traditional owners of the land is their family. They belong to the land, everything on the land, the rocks, the trees, the streams, everything is related and related to the people. So I often wonder, I mean, I, I'm not being naive here. I know that there are Indigenous Australians who are very happy to make their share of whatever minimal share it is of the money that comes from those sales. But how can non-Indigenous Australians tolerate, how can they, how can they bear to sell off what is the Indigenous people's family, their relatives? Stories like this send non-Indigenous readers right back to the fundamental assumptions of colonial culture that Bill Ashcroft talked about yesterday. Um, Jasmine Seymour's baby business, like many recent Indigenous picture books, reclaims and celebrates language and customs that have been suppressed by colonisation. The narrator is a mother telling her child about the meaning of the traditional smoking ceremony in which both body and spirit are cleansed and blessed by the smoke from a small sacred fire. It's, an, a, it's a parallel to a puja. Um, particular leaves are chosen, they are burned, um, and the smoke created is what um, is washed over the body. It's, it's um, scooped up and over the body as a blessing and a purification. Is there room in a narrative like this for non-Indigenous readers? Well, the answer is yes, if they'll suspend the cultural baggage that they bring to the environment. This is not romantic sentimentality in playing at innocence and then going straight back to, quote, normal. What it demands is a radical reimagining of life itself. And to do that, the reader is invited to reclaim the openness and possibility of becoming a baby. As the narrator bathes the baby in smoke from the fire, she tells how it will create a new relationship with the environment. And I'm going to finish with this quote from Baby Business. This is the mother speaking. There are three unfamiliar words here for you. Uh, they're from the Darug language, from uh, the Darug nation west of Sydney and the Blue Mountains. Um, Majin is uh, mother, Nura is country, um, and uh, that you'll, you'll understand that. Gurong is the baby. And I'm quoting from Baby Business. Warm smoke from the fire on your feet to connect you to country. Warm smoke from the fire on your chest. Keep your mudgeon and country close to your heart. Care for country as it cares for you. Warm smoke from the fire on your hands. Take what you need and no more. Give back what you can and help your Mudjin and Nura when they need it. Warm smoke from the fire on your mouth. Keep our language on your tongue. Our words are the song of our ancestors and show the pathway to dreaming. Listen now, my Gurong. Warm smoke from the fire on your ears, from your totem, the bee. In dreaming before you were born, I heard the song of the bees. You must always care for your totem and do it no harm. Gurung, the smoking is over. Let your life begin on Nura. Remember that it does not belong to us. We belong to country. Thank Thank you very much, sir, for your such a wonderful and mesmerizing lecture. It is really an intellectual feast to all of us. I'm sure your deliberations will definitely motivate and help us for further critical studies in children's literature and on the relevant issues discussed by you. Once again, thank you very much, sir, for your cerebral wisdom and knowledge-loaded talk on the theme of the conference. Dear friend, uh, now let's proceed for the with our next plenary sessions, uh, session speaker, we have with us Dr. Zaklina Skrenki, Assistant Professor in the Department of Branch Administration, University of Zielona Gora, Poland. 
Madam uh, is a PhD in the field of legal sciences. Dr. Zaklina is acting as an attorney in matters of administrative and civil law. The subject of her scientific interest focuses primarily on the area of medical law and includes in particular the principles of operation and liability of medical entities. The subject of patients' rights and claims for their infringement as well as the principles of medical profession and liability for medical errors. In her publications, Madam Zaklina also touches upon problems concerning public health and security, not only health related, but also non-legal aspects too. Madam will enlighten us today in this plenar second plenary session on ecological security in its individual and structural dimension, the role of the individual in the process of its creation and development. I now request and welcome Dr. Zeklina Ma to proceed for the session. Over to you, Zeklina Ma. Thank you. And thank you very much um, for the invitation and uh, opportunity to speak in a, such an excellent group of speakers. In my speech, uh, I will present the concept of ecological security. The phenomena that uh, threaten this security should be considered not only from the point of view of nature, whose uh, resources are limited and devastated. They should be understood primarily as a threat to humans. His existence is threatened if he lacks fresh air and clean water. However, man is also threatened by another human being. Respect for nature also means respect for another human being. Meanwhile, inequality, alienation, and the disappearance of human solidarity are increasing. The aim of this speech is to draw attention to those activities which can and should be undertaken by an individual, regardless of the IP claypol legal regulation and actions or inactivity of the state and in institutions established to defend his rights. In fact, the conscious attitude and the behavior of the individual in everyday situations can significantly affect the state of the environment. An individual is also responsible for his or her own health, the loss of which he or she can and should prevent in many cases. Treating other creatures with respect and above all yourself and others is of fundamental importance in making healthy relationships in the world enabling a dignified and safe life for the present and future generations. The first part of my speech concerns issues of environmental security and environmental justice. The second part of my speech concerns the role of the individual and the task of the individual in ensuring these values. Finally, I come up with conclusions. The notion of ecological security should be understood as obtaining a state of the environment which allows for safe staying in this environment and enables the use of this environment in a manner ensuring human development. Actions improving the current state of the environment and programming its further development are the duty of public authorities uh, in accordance with the Polish constitution but also the duty of citizens, whose authorities should support in actions for the protection and improvement of the environment. It is an obligation to take care of the environment and responsibility for the deterioration of the environment caused by them. On the one hand, it is the individual's behavior towards the environment as an obligation regulated by law concretized by a system of orders and prohibitions. On the other hand, it is the application by public authorities of legal instruments, ensuring the individual's right to the environment and the right to live safety in the natural environment. It is therefore the duty of public authorities to ensure access to healthy environment for everyone. The state, the international community, but also uh, perhaps above all the individual is responsible for the state of the environment. 
The question arises whether an individual needs legal regulations which will impose what and how he or she can do, or whether the individual will take action on his or her own initiative, which serve the environment or at least do not harm it. Environmental security can be seen as a practical category and a mental category. Practical category means understanding this notion as the factual state of the environment in a given place and time, which depends on politics, negotiations, international relations. Action taken should serve the purpose of maintaining the state of the environment, restoring the disturbed state to the level of current standard, undertaking undertakings to improve it. In the sense of the mental category, it is a full and universal awareness of the environment by the human population, that is environmental awareness. One of the visible manifestations of this awareness is the creation of appropriate legal acts, constituting the basis for strategic decisions and planning and investments activities for, the, for environmental protection. Ecological awareness means making right decisions, making right choices, However, for this to happen, it is necessary, first of all, to have knowledge and secondly, to develop correct attitudes. Ecological security is most important for human life. Due to the importance of the environment and natural resources, it is decisive for the further duration and development of man and appears to be one of the most important aspects of security. There is no dualism between man and nature. It is impossible to separate them. Nature is not something separate. We are included in it. We are part of it. We permit each other. The recognition by man that he is a part of nature is permanently connected with it and its products will cause man to take care of it and use it in moderation. The production of the natural environment is not unlimited. Taking into account the principle of sustainable development, it must meet the needs not only of the present, but also of the next generations. Meanwhile, man irresponsibly exploits the goods, behaves like an owner and ruler entitled to rob the earth, forgetting that our own body is made up of the elements of our planet, its air allows us to breathe, its water revives us and renews us. Uncontrolled development and overexploitation make man not only dangerous to the environment, but he also starts threatening himself. Modern man is characterized by a lack of prudence, guided by a sense of his own omnipotence and limitlessness. Bearing in mind only his own good, man, like other species of living beings, not only uses the environment for the purpose of survival, but in addition, without restraint, conquers nature and develops civilization without regard for the environmental cost of these transformations. The exploitation of the planet on which we live demands honest and rational planning. This exploitation for industrial and military purpose, the uncontrolled development of technology, carries a threat to the natural environment, alienates men in relation to nature, tears him away from it. Man sees only those meaning of the natural environment that serve the purposes of immediate use and consumption. Man wants to possess and use more than to be and to grow. He uses the resources of the earth in the excessive and disordered way. This exposes his own life. At the root of the faultless destruction of the environment is an anthropological error. Man has the power to arbitrarily dispose of the earth by subordinating it to his own absolute will. However, it has a shape previously determined by God, which man can develop, but to which, but to which he cannot embezzle. Man takes the place of God in the work of creation and provokes the rebellion of nature, nature for whom he is a tyrant. 
However, nature is not a composition of forces and raw materials that people can freely use and move the components of natural ecosystems like furniture in a room. Ecosystems such as, such as uh, forest ecosystems, uh, coral reefs, river ecosystems are functional, functional whole. They have been shaped in evolutionary processes by the mutual adaptation of various organisms which form systemic communities in them, linked energetically through extremely complex food chains. Man, like all other heterotrophic species, has had to draw its livelihoods from the environment since the dawn of time, and has therefore had to exploit and transform the environment. But before the industrial age, at the collecting and hunting stage, the exploitation of nature did not affect its its uh, regenerative capacities. When fishing, people did not exceed the capacity of the fishing grounds, did not turn back the course of rivers or, or drain marshes. Although they always produced pollutants, before the invention of plastics, they were organic. So they entered the nat natural cycles of metabolism and did not exceed the ability to self-clean the environment. Human activities did not change the natural order, this did not disturb the dynamic balance of ecosystems. Only the full bloom of technical civilization, that is the increase of human power in transforming the environment, contributed to its excessive pollution and enabled a fast pace of human development. This caused that expensive human population not only limited the access of other non-human species to environmental resources, but also deprived them of their living space. The exploitation of the environment, however, threatens first and foremost men and may lead to ecological exclusion. Ecological exclusion is the situation of an individual in which he or she is forced to live in an environment that does not provide him or her with even minimum ecological standards. He or she does not breathe fresh air, may not have access to clean water, and has no access to green areas. This significantly lowers his or her quality of life and well-being, and then causes a person's health to deteriorate. The loss of health make it, makes it difficult for a person to do a job, to find a job suitable for their qualification, and this in turn leads to social exclusion. Having no means to life a decent, live a decent life, he cannot change his place of residence. The lack of adequate living conditions can be an obstacle to finding employment, and also lead to social exclusion. Often the fact that an individual lives in ecologically excluded areas is caused by his or her poor economic situation. A person has no job or badly paid, cannot move. He, she is in health decline, loses job. It is difficult to distinguish between cause and effect here. Social exclusion means economic exclusion, but it must be emphasized that this also has consequences in the sphere of interpersonal relations, access to culture and recreation. As the crisis intensifies, eco-environmental injustice will depend. That is, the possibility of using various natural values will be reduced and even the exclusion of particular groups and communities from the access to the goods so much valued today. Their deficit may lead not only to the exclusion of individuals or groups of people. It can also lead to new dispute, conflicts, battles on, and wars over, for example, healthy water, fertile soil, and other goods. Environmental justice is the care of the poor who are even limited in their access to their environment. It is the fair distribution of natural goods, both for present and future generations. The concept expresses the care of the land so that it may be a genuine gift for all people. For many communities, the limited access to a healthy and clean environment 
puts people in an uh, unequal situation where some enjoy reasonably good ecological health and others live in a degraded environment with polluted air, water and soil in conditions that do not meet any health standard. Unfavorable environmental changes are reconciling the most elementary basis of human existence. People who experience the effects of harmful ecological conditions not only get rid of or limit their access to natural health, recreational and aesthetic values, and thus significantly reduce the level and quality of their lives. It also put them in a position incomparably worse than those who are lucky enough to live in environmentally healthy areas or using their material status can choose such, such places of residence. Favorable or unfavorable ecological situation of particular areas and entire regions becomes yet another and clearly felt cause of social disparities, which to a large extent determines the level of satisfaction of many needs and determines the quality of life in the group dimension. This situation leads to the exacerbation of injustice and the emergence of a new kind of inequality. Ecological problems directly affect the somatic health and quality of life of individuals, but ecology is also a relationship between people in a society which is the natural environment of human life in the family and school, in the district, in the workplace, in the state, in the world. The environment does not only serve the physical, biological and economic development of man, but is also supposed to ensure his personal and social development. The destruction of the natural environment occurs in addition to the even more dangerous destruction of the human environment. The ecological crisis is a consequence on man's conceit as his lack of respect for the natural environment, his selfishness as his disregard for other individuals. The ecological crisis is a family crisis, a social crisis, a crisis on an axiological value level. The source of this crisis is excessive anthropocentrism, but man, his goodness and dignity remain the highest goals. One cannot speak of harmony, justice, and security if one does not show respect for the other person and the environment. Man has to fight not only for the preservation of the natural environment, but also for the good and the protection of the dignity of the other. The right to dignity encompass a set of rights to ensure that every human person is respected regardless of his or her personal qualifications, social utility, intellectual or physical capacity. The protection of human dignity is inextricably linked to the protection of one of the most important values, which is human life. The protection of human life cannot be understood merely as the protection of the minimum biological functions necessary for existence, but as a guarantee of proper development and of attainment and maintenance of a normal psychophysical conditions, which must be equated with the concept of health. The crisis of the human family manifests itself in the stratification of society, the isolation of the rich from the problems of the poor, lack of fairness of division, and moderate consumerism causes dissatisfaction, increases tensions, revolts. There are districts where there is, is unlimited consumption and waste of goods, as well as districts of misery. People use each other, satisfy particular and secondary needs instead of basic and authentic ones. Man focuses on possession and use and incapable of mastering his own instinct and passions. The social media impose fashions and opinions. A civilization with a materialistic profile causes men to become a slave to things. The tendency to replace real relations with communication via the internet allows for the selection or elimination of relations. This type of communication prevents a truly shared experience. Melancholy, 
this satisfaction, finally isolation grows. The human being remains alone in an increasingly polluted environment, increasingly, increasingly rejected by people, incomprehensible. Housing estates are being built at the disposal of a few with no access for others, so as not to disturb the artificial peace. Urbanization destroyed ties, family, and neighborhood communities. A person feels lonely in an anonymous crowd that surrounds him, among whom he feels a stranger. Social urbanization is very important for human security. It is the acquisition by the population of features of the called urban lifestyle. These features include special segregation of inhabitants created of the basic of racial and ethnic diversity, socioeconomic position, specific tastes and preference. In a mass of people of different origins and backgrounds, family, friendship and neighborhood ties either do not exist at all or are relatively weak. And cohesion in such societies is maintained through formal social control mechanisms. Social relationships become impersonal, shallow and fleeting, with affects individual security. Special proximity does not entail proximity in the psychosocial sense. At the same time, the individual is dependent on others to satisfy his or her life's need. But the only thing that drives him or her when he or she meets others is rationality and calculating. I will now begin the second part of my sketch, uh, second part, uh, responsibility and task of the individual. Uh, as a lawyer, I, um, I trust the rationality of the law and recognize that is, um, it is a regulator of social life. As a citizen, I respect the law. As a lawyer, I can analyze whether the law is right and necessary. As a citizen, I do not always look for such a justification, but the conviction that certain laws are legitimate, reasonable, makes it possible for citizens to carry out their obligations under the law of their own free will, without the need for coercive measures. The law does not have to be comprehensive to regulate the social relations, but it must be flexible. It must respond to, changing, respond to changing realities. In the meantime, by making more and more laws and thus extending the scope of regulations, attempts are being made to resolve all social issues and problems. In the field of environmental protection, many regulations are enforced at the international level and oblige states to take certain direct actions, but also to introduce legal regulations. National law applies to institutions, entrepreneurs and citizens, and may impose its certain obligations on them and limit prohibitions. There are many such restrictions, but you have to consider whether this is enough. Consider whether they will be followed. An effective system of control must be established to ensure that legal obligations are fulfilled. Is it possible to cover and control all areas of life around the clock? Such extensive control is possible maybe in a totalitarian state where every citizen would be a member of a state organization and thus a member of the state apparatus. The amount of legal regulations is limitless. New ones are still being created as if they were a remedy for all human ailments. Meanwhile, it is forgotten that the most important thing is the attitude of the individual. No legal system will change it. Even assuming that the public authorities will severely punish her for inappropriate, unfavorable behavior, they are not able to organize the police apparatus to control everyone. Punishment is not always effective either. Sometimes it is more profitable, profitable for an individual to pay a fine, cash penalty, than, than to comply with the rules. That is why it is important to shape attitudes. It is important to realize the role of small steps, 
take by each person in shaping clean environment, but also healthy human relations. They are inextricably linked. Is there a need for regulations that state that an animal as a living being is capable of feeling suffering and is not a thing, and then man owes it respect, protection, and care? Will regulation convince those who treat animals as objects, or will they convince uh, those who treat even another person as objects? There are a number of regulations that define the obligation of citizens to limit negative impacts of the environment and to reduce its pollution. In Poland, for example, there is an obligation to conclude a contract for waste disposal, an obligation to connect the property to the existing sewage system or to collect waste generated on the property in a selective manner. Violations of these regulations are constantly observed. An individual's responsibility also applies to his or her own health. Here, we are not able to create legal regulations that would induce an individual to behave in such a way as, for example, eating healthily, taking up sport. It is necessary to develop healthy habits for preventive examinations, self-assessment of own health, behavior concerning habits, addictions, medical attention, and adherence to recommendations. Regulations that are intended to encourage a healthy lifestyle exist, although they are primarily of a restrictive nature and are intended to stop people from doing harm to them. Such regulations include a ban of selling alcohol and tobacco products to minors, restriction or bans on, on advertising these products and services legal restriction on the number of alcohol sales places and the ban on smoking in public places. The nutrition regulation determined the amount of sugar, fat, and salt in products intended for sale to students. However, we do not know whether a student on his way to school will not buy sweets or bring them from home. Another example of pro-ecological actions can be actions such as cleaning up the world, clearing forests and rivers, but also the adoption of resolution by various bodies, protest actions of ecological organizations, and even intimidation by eco-terrorists. However, only a lasting change in human thinking is effective, from exploiting nature to living with nature. Ecological awareness is created through education at, and upbringing. Care for the environment as a natural law is written in the forms, form conscience. The solution to ecological problems should start with a change in the way of thinking. This can only be achieved through education. Education is family, school, environment, self-education of an individual. Ecological education, which covers all areas of life, should be present at school and above all at home. It should refer to the emotional sphere and not be limited to the intellectual delivery of knowledge. It should start in kindergarten and last for the whole life. The family should instill correct attitudes, eliminating waste, prevent preventing waste, using reusable packaging, teaching animal care, increasing responsibility, sensitivity to the beauty of nature, pointing to the ecological problems of the local community, which are close, not necessarily national or international, because this seems too abstract. In the field of health curve, the basic role is to play it by social campaigns, health programs. They are intended to promote appropriate attitudes, encourage and motivate. Informing and convincing, or at least drawing attention to the problem, are the goals of social campaigns. There are an element of education directed to the whole society or specific social groups. Although there is no doubt that these are different in the susceptibility to this kind of activity. The aim of education is to provide society with information about the environment and the changes taking place in it 
to create correct attitudes of society. An attitude of responsibility, awareness, and the ability to predict the effects of actions taken should be created. A person should be shaped, instilled with respect for life, his own health, the environment. It should be remembered that the environment also includes the other individual. Care for the natural environment results from respect for the other person. Other aspects of human environment should also be taken into account. Today's ecological treats are not only about taking care of nature and other living beings, but also about tearing men out of the virtual world and computer games, introducing him to the real world, the world of living nature. It is the drawing of attention to another living man with his cares, feelings, and needs. And finally, um, conclusion. The state is obliged uh, to take care of the protection and safeguarding of such collective goods as a natural and human environment. It is, however, primarily the individual who should take care of the environment. The individual is responsible for the state of the environment, for respect for other creatures, for healthy relations in the world. The multiplicity of legal regulations and the law enforcement apparatus cannot replace responsible conduct and ecological awareness. A person should values. Men should perceive the environment as a place of life and development, as well as the created cultural heritage, which should be passed on the future generations in the best possible conditions. The natural world is home to people. This is possible when man, man uses nature without, without destroying it. Thus, an ecological attitude towards the environment must overcome the one-sided pragmatic utilitarian approach. A conscious and responsible attitude to one's own, own health and environment determines the maturity of men. Men must understand that the most depends on his own actions. Men should also recognize that his attitude to his own health and environment is subject to evaluation, ethical qualification. Respect for life and health is a consequence of man's privileged position among other creatures, because he was created in the ima image and likeness of God. Just as life is a gift from God, also the environment represents a value and in itself as a divine work. Regardless of the acceptance of this position, Respect for nature should result from its importance for human existence and concern for the condition of natural goods from respect for the other human being, both present and future generations. Evil done to nature is an evil done to another human being, an act against health and life. The human individual is also bound to accept that harmony with the environment which is a common good of all people, is the guarantee of its continuance since man is one with nature. Even the most advanced technologies cannot replace man's water and air. The condition of its duration is also to make a force to maintain the psychophysical conditions, thanks to which the individual can benefit from the goods of this world and develop and perfect himself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Angel, for your scholarly session. We thoroughly enlightened by your speech. What we could conclude from, uh, from your talk is, for an individual, environment degradation means ecological exclusion. When we are forced to live in an environment that does not provide even minimum ecological standards, this ecological exclusion in turn leads in a way to social exclusion. And that is very true when you said we are responsible for our own health, our own uh, preserving environment, the loss of which we can prevent by treating other creatures with respect. Only this will enable us for a dignified and safe life for coming generations. 
thank you very much for your mesmerizing and insightful thoughts madam uh, dear friend thank you it was a great pleasure <laughs> Dear friends, after this two knowledge loaded and enlightening sessions by Professor Dr. Mark McLeod and Dr. Zakilina Skrentiman, now we should proceed towards the valedictory address. Friends, we are honored to have uh, Professor Jaydeep Sarangi for addressing the valedictory function. It's a privilege for me to uh, welcome the professor. Dr. Sarangi is the professor, Department of English, and the principal of New Alipur College, Kolkata, India. Sir is a bilingual poet with nine collections of books. Sir's recent collection, entitled Heart Raining the Lights, released in Rome, Italy. He is noted critic with 46 books, and several scholarly research publications are there in leading journals to his credit. Professor has recited his poems and delivered keynotes, plenary talks, in different shows of the globe. His later readings were at Flinders University, University of Western Australia, University of Wollongong, Perth Poetry Club Australia, University of Udin, Italy, and University in Poland. Sir has edited with Rob Harley, six poetry anthologies from Australia and India. He has edited the collection of poetry entitled Home Thoughts, Poetry of the British Indian Diaspora, which was published in 2017 with Usha Kishore. The book has been widely acknowledged and is gradually attracted by the wide readers and has come into the scholastic discussions as well. Professor edits Tista. It is an online international journal for poetry and poetry criticism. He is also known as the Bard of Dulu for his several poems on the river and its nearby places, temples, and habitations. At present, Sir is the Vice President of Guild of Indian English Writers, Editors and Critics, Kerala, and also the Vice President and Executive Council for IPPL, ICCR, Kolkata. Sir, I welcome and invite you for the valedictory address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon and good uh, approaching evening from the city of Chai, Kolkata. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shudhir Nikam and uh, Madhavi Nikam for this in, uh, invitation. I am honored. I'm also honored to share this session with Mark Macklin and uh, Jacqueline Spreti uh, from Australia and Poland. My hearty uh, congratulations. I thoroughly enjoyed your talks. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. And uh, my regards from the city of joy to Australia and Poland to loving nations for me. And, and I have formed great uh, admiration for both all of you. Uh, it's very interesting that we are talking about uh, literature, culture, and environment. And uh, it's an important time that we are living when people are constituting borders, but we are looking forward to a borderless state. Now, very interestingly, within the Indian continent, if we can think of India, there are several Indias because the culturally India is so different because of, it has so many cultures, so many languages, so many communities, food habits, uh, dresses, everything is so different that if one can come and no one can ever understand what is India and what is real India. For even an Indian, it is impossible to understand India. It is impossible to uh, describe India in one or two sentences. Now, very interestingly, if we think of a borderless state in modern post-colonial theory, when we can think of the global village concept, the, uh, within uh, the territory of India, within a political boundary or geographical boundary, we have certain uh, predicaments and certain situations, certain cultural contexts, linguistic discourses, which bind people together locally. Post-colonialism is a celebration of the local. My small river, my small hometown, a cafe shop, or a tea shop, 
a roadside tea shop may be uh, celebrated in a language which is international. Uh, that concept of borderless society, that is ideal. That is, of course, and we all want that all borders should be removed and we should be one family, one territory, one political identity. But that may be utopian in some sense. I hope all of us have gone through Bill Ashcroft's famous essay on utopianism and where he proposes the utopian society where we can think of a mutual bonding of each other and mutual sharing of things for each other, culture on, on, on actually on transition. And everyone should understand, collaborate, cooperate with societies immediate, also international. India is a, is a miniature of the world where we have so many cultures to live in. Suppose I come from Calcutta, and if we go to the move to the northeastern part of India, there are the states and each state is unique about culture, language, and of course, all social values. Therefore, when we come in contact, our ideas of nationality is as a big question. Who is whose nationality? The nationality of an Indian, the nationality of a monolingual, monocultural country, other concepts are very fuzzy. But of course, there are binding forces that bind us, India as a nation state, because we have a political territory, we have a sociological territory, we, we have so many things common under one umbrella, even though there are so many differences among us in uh, all different dimensions. Now, India is celebrating these days the idea of populism, the idea of the common, because India is championing now the idea of very common people. Now, if we go back in the past, it was enjoyed by the Brahminical society. By Brahminical society, I mean, the elites and educated elites who have English education and who have some status in their social status and political status and all linguistic status, privilege class. But with the rise of, uh, uh, with the rise of, I would say, the marginal discourse uh, from the 1970s, last 50 years for India as a rise of the common people, I would say, because 1970s, early part of 1970s, in the city of Mumbai, we have seen the movement of Dalit Panther, the, uh, that championed the Dalit movement in India, and it became infectious to other states of India. And uh, within a time of the next 50, uh, 48 to 50, uh, 49 years of time, Dalit discourse, Dalit marginal discourse, has become a part and parcel of Indian living totality. Before 1972, 71, the description of an Indian was India in a in India through the lenses of maybe Gandhi or maybe through Jawaharlal Nehru. But oh, in 1930s, with the publication of uh, Annihilation of Caste by Ambedkar, the definition of India became something different. I know Ambedkar was the flower in Fule's garden. Fule and then Ambedkar and the constitutional rights that Ambedkar could institute, that initiated the rise of the common after the Indian independence. It took another 20 years or so, coming to 1970s, where Dalit Panther movement, which initiated the populism, I will say, in a sense, or the championing of the common, championing the common, in a sense, in that. And of course, the one thing that Indians are carrying these days, the Bollywood films. And the Bollywood films, if we see in 72, 74, 75 onwards, we have some exceptions in the early period, like Kuli and others, 
but in the 75 onwards, we have seen the Dollywood films also given privilege to the commoners or uh, people from the common become heroes. People could not think of someone hero from the common class. So literature took part and the film continued flourishing, championing the common. And that initiated a new dimension of description of an Indian. Because now in the vision of India becomes complete with the angles of uh, three angles, of course, the new India vision by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, our first prime minister, of course, Gandhian vision of India, the religious coexistence, and Ambedkar's vision of India, the uh, structures, pyramid of social pyramid within India. Now, India can never be described without penetrating this social stratification of India. That's why the, the rise of the margin in India in last 45 years to 50 years time is an important discourse. Another important thing that happened by the time of 1970s, later on or 80s, Indians, at least with English education for three or four, two, two or three generations. Therefore, they could use English effectively for uh, translations of their vernaculars into English. All these Dalit writings are vibrant in their vernaculars. And it all became, it started translations into English and which became part of uh, the readership all across the globe. Think of uh, anything uh, like, you know, uh, the psychological uh, criticism. If uh, I will say the translation of Freud into English, which made all possible, uh, which made all possible for all the readers and critics to understand psychological uh, modes of reading and interpretation. Therefore, translation is very essential and was essential in 80s when Dalit texts, marginal texts of India uh, were getting translated into other vernaculars also in English. And it took 20, 25 years time to become part of the university curriculum so that because translations as well as criticism, no literature will survive unless there is support from criticism. Shakespeare is still read in the classroom because Shakespearean criticism is still moving, is dynamic. Therefore, Dalit discourse in one hand, Dalit translation in one hand, and also critical discourse as secondary material for critical studies of literature, Dalit literature, marginal literature, which contributed to which, uh, uh, each other and became a very solid body of writing in 2000 onwards. Another important thing happened in 1992, the translation of Marathi Dalit literature into English literature by Arjun Dangle. Arjun Dangle's contribution, I'll say, is a kind of epoch making, pioneering, because he came out with an edited book, a Marathi discourse of Dalit literature into English. And after that, many regional language Dalit writers started translating that English book into other vernaculars. So it became pan-Indian parameter after the publication of Dangle's monumental book, Poison Rage. In 1990s, the Dalit discourse and marginal discourse become very prevalent in Indian academia. Now, another thing is very important for Indian academia and Indian discourse, that is the uh, eco uh, mysticism. Indians are always known as uh, some kind of spiritual bend of mind. There are pockets in India where spiritualism is considered to be a mission of life. It is a dharma. It is, it is something called divine and the union with the divine. And we have seen mysticism 
in British literature, among British theorists, and also in European uh, theories, as well as in perceptions. We know uh, William Wordsworth's inclination towards mysticism, and uh, he thought a nature as a living sentient. Similarly, William Blake, the proto-romantic, he considered nature as something through which you can uh, attain God to see the world in a grain of sand. Now, romantics and proto-romantics, they influenced uh, the early Indian writers in vernacular as well as in English. And India is the storehouse of mystical writings. We had Tukaram, we have Kabir, and we had the Gharana, and we have the upbringing throughout life and throughout from child, since childhood that different cults, different practices, meditation, yoga, all contributed to the mind of India, the identity of India. And uh, by eco-mysticism, that is another perspective of looking into the text. Suppose uh, Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore, he founded Shantini Ketan, which is far away from Calcutta. It is totally green romantic life, an idyllic situation, almost like Lake District uh, in, uh, in England. So it is almost, it's not, there is no scope of Lake District, but it's full of forest areas, the forest scape, which contributed a kind of mental understanding, a kind of soul to soul communication with nature. Therefore, if you look into Tagore's paintings, Tagore's songs, Tagore's uh, uh, music, Tagore's poetry, Tagore's novels, short stories, the one thing that, uh, that is most important is eco-mysticism. And uh, he, was a, he was a kind of reformer uh, in the social sector as well as the banking sector. He, he started rural banking also and agricultural banking, which is very important. And all this contributed to a great uh, tradition of Indian uh, writing uh, in vernacular as well as in English. Now, if we come to the use of English, if we read Empire's Right Back by Bill Ashcroft, there is a special chapter called Rewriting English. So he talks about how English has been contextualized in different backgrounds and different cultures, in different linguistic traditions. So in India, in, with Indian resources, Indian resourcefulness in culture, as well as in different vernaculars, different languages, in the English has been Indianized. And uh, now English is vibrant in India because the Indianness, the property, its root is in India. It has the flavor of boiled rice. It has the flavor of the soil of India. It has the flora and fauna of India. It has taken roots in Indian culture and social nuances. Therefore, when Amitav Ghosh or Ruzdi or uh, uh, any great Anita Desai or anyone who comes out with an Indian English novel or a novel and which falls back to cities like Mumbai or in Kolkata, there are so many factors, there are so many cultural components that go into the making of the novel complex as well as I'll say multifaceted. Because one thing about India is if there is any heart of India, heart is multiculturalism heart is multilingualism and the heart of India is translation. I understand a person from Mumbai because of the translation of a, of a language which is Indianized. Well, I don't know Marathi and uh, people listening to me in Maharashtra don't know uh, uh, Bengali, but we communicate in English or we communicate in Hindi. So we understand each other through translation. We communicate heart to heart, through a heart, that is our translation. Now in Indian cultural scenario, 
English has been devised, I will say rationalized, and also been uh, appended and adapted into the cultural context that is totally Indian and is used for the Indian purpose. Now, here I have one humble submission to all who are listening to me. Suppose I am working on Indian discourse, Indian theoretical discourse. So Indian theoretical discourse, there is a whole large body of literature as well as criticism to interpret that. Of course, we have different parameters and combinations from the West. We learn from the West, we utilize it in India, and we also develop our own criticism. We have developed it and to uh, uh, interpret and to discourse with Indian parameters and context. I'm really glad that in this particular webinar, we have understood different perspectives of life, manners, culture, society, language, uh, and environment. And we cannot deny the fact that we produce a different world and we are heading forward to a different world, the world of new opportunities, the world of new avenues, the world of new resources, how we use that liter through literature, how we use that through our perception and through our uh, intuition, that is very important. I congratulate all who are involved in this webinar and all esteemed speakers from different countries for making them available and making them hard. We pay homage to all of you. We are all great nations. We connect our minds and we connect continents. I will conclude by reading out a poem by me recently written, and it is addressed to Sarah Gilbert, who has invented the vaccine in Oxford. For you, Sarah Gilbert, the sky suffered all toxins, the earth drank up all sins, forest, a weakness of all killings, yet man has no exit door to open. Still man is alive for man, away from his deadly weapons. I own Tori, if there were, we able to love humans a little more. Jealousy has ruined you, ruined me. Green leads, more greedy secretions. Take away the land, encroach the soil. The rice bowl is spears into two. The art could have been more beautiful if the weapon of power is taken away. If we could throw out all cars to missiles, each house would have been heaven. The lost world will be back. All you and I lost. We don't want to lose the evaporated dewdrops. We can cure all abandoned homes. You are my mother, mother of all. You are the youngest sister, a healing herb. You stay awake and rub all sobs. You never split a man from a man. Two eyes of the world are awake. Oh, my darling sister, a healing herb, a universal nurse for all who ails us all. You never split a man from a human. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir, for this uh, poetical piece at the end. We were so we are so fortunate to listen to you. And uh, the moment, the way you recited the poem, we are really obliged. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, sir, your deliberation definitely has opened up new avenues to the horizons of literary world and translation too. Thank you very much for spending your valuable time and sharing your thoughts with us. Now, here is an announcement. Uh, for all the participants who have actively participated since yesterday, uh, that uh, all the registered participants will get the feedback link along with the certificate in PDF format. Please kindly fill uh, the feedback form and send it to us. You will get your uh, feedback link and certificate on your registered email ID. 
thank you very much and uh, now i request uh, i'm sure uh, that uh, sorry it's my pr proud privilege to put our sincere thanks on record to the eminent speakers for the sharing their intellectual thoughts and knowledge with all of us uh, now i request uh, dr sudhir nikam sir the convener to present the report of the of this two days international e conference sudhir nikam sir uh, thank you dr sangeeta thank you uh, friends uh, since uh, yesterday we are having deliberations on different areas of knowledge on the theme of uh, the e conference literature culture and environment the keynote speaker professor bill ashcroft professor emeritus school of arts and media the university of new uh, south wales sydney australia talked on a climate of hope the post colonial the environment and the utopian in his speech he talked about post colonialism environmentalism eco centrism environmental justice and peace and explored the connection professor ascroft talked about the role of literature the way marginality of literature utopianism etc he explained the concept like uh, hearing beyond the silence which appealed to most of the uh, participants and he focused on silent knowledge and beyond interpretation his talk was focused upon thinking beyond the human world and he advised to think like a snow gum or think like a mountain so it was a very uh, touching experience uh, to interact with professor bilestrop he also talked about the concept living beyond the present inhabiting the future through the literature and power of literature in uh, executing it so i thank professor bilestrop for uh, delivering his excellent uh, keynote address the second plenary session was dr evangelia vasilaku from international uh, academic advisor and english instructor from athens greece her topic of presentation was pandemic films and lockdown literature interpreting the cinematic and literary sample in her speech she talked on pandemic covid 19 and marked the outbreak of art and art of renaissance she also talked about cinema and literature interdependent interdependent concepts uh, build and grow together that is was uh, what was the theme uh, she had focused upon she also talked about fictional and semi realistic films with social responses to various diseases portrayed in films her talk also was centered upon uh, and uh, discussed about bioterrorism fear artistic credibility scientific credibility despair global anxiety death isolation art of film making rapo between film and literature uh, for instance the contagion film and corona fear is a uh, virus this is what she talked about she also uh, discussed lockdown literature the group of authors with books and poems published during corona uh, pandemic period she talked about uh, uh, pandemic poetry and analyzed it by using basic elements at the end she marked all major events in history be it war or pandemic reinforce its response <coughs> in the form of art and inspire outbreak of art in today's plenary sessions dr mark macleod from charles stuart university in wagga wagga australia talked on wild things in the city reimagining the build environment in children's picture books and uh, his fa special focus was environment the way environment has been delineated in uh, children's uh, fiction so his excellent talk on environment in children's literature uh, and young adult fiction he talked about environmental justice in children's books reimagined the power of environment in children's books he also referred number of books to explain 
the built and reframed uh, environment while thanks new narrative technique ideas of human belonging to environment new relationship with environment new approaches towards environment through the books like the university of disaster a walk of thumbi money's walk to the park the tales from the inner city belonging etc in the recent plenary talk dr jaklina skrenty from uh, poland she has uh, discussed ecological security the role of individual in the process of its creation and development uh, in her talk she has uh, focused ecological security should be considered as a threat to mankind so this uh, talk was the most introductory kind of uh, discussion she also discussed the conscious attitude and behavior attitude of the individual significantly affect the state of environment she also uh, discussed about the concerned issues in ecological security and environmental justice individual downfall causes environments downfall so uh, both these downfalls are interdependent so uh, she has given a very clear message that we need to take clear uh, 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 stand of the uh, connection between individual that is human being and environment so everything should not be human centered even uh, the inhabitants on the earth should be taken into consideration while thinking about environment she also talked about the good responsibility and task of individual it helps to save environment so all the sessions were enriching the last uh, session that is keynote uh, the valedictory address by professor jaydeep sarangi my uh, dear friend she has taken a very brief survey of indian writing in english and various issues and concerns theoretical literary poetic from various uh, fields of uh, literature and lastly concluded his speech with a beautiful poem and i am i feel uh, privileged to have professor sarangi with us who is also apart from being academician a well known poet uh, in india uh, who has an internationally uh, acclaimed uh, image uh, all over the globe uh, i also uh, put on record the paper presentations uh, that were made yesterday in various plenary sessions in which um, hundreds of papers were presented by uh, various uh, research scholars senior teachers some of the areas covered in the paper presentations uh, we could uh, note down almost uh, 37 areas on which the research papers in parallel paper presentations were shared to name a few uh literature and green future global and uh, regional concerns activism and environment crisis animal rights and literature conquest of new world in uh, literature early modern travel writing some of such areas were presented in paper presentation sessions and one important thing about paper presentations in parallel paper presentations is that once the paper presenters uh, present their papers they remain friend forever they keep on sharing their knowledge their research finding their ideas with each other even after this conference gets over so all the papers presented in the conference will be published in the month of october in the journal of higher education and research society and it will be a special issue on environment literature and culture i am sure the issue will show the directions in further research in the area of environment literature and culture so i thank from the depth of my heart to all the delegates guests and the coordinators who are day and night working since last few days for the success of this conference thank you thanks a lot over to dr sangeeta thank you sir thank you for presenting uh, the holistic report of this two days international e conference friends i'm sure and hope all the participants and delegates will definitely agree with me that we have really experienced the intellectual phase as promised by both dr sudhir nikam the convener of this conference 
and Dr. Madhavi Ma'am, the organizing secretary of the conference during their concept note and welcome address respectively. Thank you very much. Friends, we have almost reached to the concluding session of the conference and that is word of thanks. For this, may I request Dr. Madhavi Madam to propose word of thanks? Dr. Madhavi Ma'am. Uh, good evening to one and all. Uh, so after the two days, Sajon, we have come to the end of this conference, but I would not like to say that it's an end of the conference, but I would like to say it's the beginning with so much of discourse that has gone on for two days. I would like to say it's just the beginning of knowing more about environment, literature, and culture. Uh, let me take the privilege to propose vote of thanks to each and every one, to all the delegates, the paper presenters, and to each and every one who has joined us uh, in this journey. Uh, at the outset, let me thank the speakers who enlightened our minds and developed a discourse on environment, literature, and culture, compelling all of us to dwell deep into the arena of environment, literature, and culture with their expertise and knowledge and the intellectual feast that they have provided us for the last two days. Let me take the honor of expressing my gratitude to the keynote speaker, Professor Bill Ashcroft from Australia for blessing us with not only his presence, but his intellectual deliberations and mastery uh, in the subject. Uh, I would also like to express my sincere thanks to uh, the writer, uh, Professor Daya Disanayake from Sri Lanka, Professor Evangelia Vasaluka from Greece, uh, Professor Mark McLeod from Australia, Professor Zaklina Skrenti from Poland, and uh, our very dear friend, uh, Professor Jaydeep Sarangi, sir, for being with us for the valedictory function as a valedictory speaker over here. Uh, my special thanks to all the speakers once again. So efforts to all the speakers once again. Uh, I would like to also mention the efforts of the anchors, because the efforts of the anchors must not go unnoticed so my gratitude to Dr. Pandurang Barkale and Dr. Sangeeta Kongre for putting in all the efforts from last two days to, you know, meet the, uh, to make the meets end, coordinating with the speakers and making them available for all of us at the right time. My technical assistance uh, uh, was, the technical assistance was given to us by a wonderful team of four very, very eminent uh, scholars and, uh, you know, our friends whom I should mention here uh, first and foremost, Dr. Sudhir Mungre, whom all of you all must be knowing by now, now for his coordination that he has done with all of us. Uh, principal Dr. Umesh Kumar Bagal, sir. Uh, principal, do, uh, sorry, Dr. Balaji Sheke, Dr. Prakash Navgiri, the four pillars of the technical assistance that we have had for conducting the sessions very, very smoothly. Without them, the conduct of this function wouldn't have been possible the way it could have been uh, otherwise. So we are backed by a very uh, a team of very proactive and devoted friends whose involvement and willingness to take uh, on the completion of the task beyond their comfort zone motivates us to organize such events. Such mega events is not possible without the support of the, the, the friends that we have in our team. So I would like to express my deepest sense of appreciation for the coordination, for the patience, and the zeal with which they conduct, they have conducted uh, more than 16 parallel sessions of paper presenters, 200 plus paper presentations we had yesterday. And you can just imagine the Herculean task these people have really uh, undergone. So my deepest sense of appreciation uh, for all those who worked as coordinators, uh, I would just like to mention their names so that I don't remain much indebted to them. Uh, I know words cannot really satisfy the feelings or the gratitude that I really want to express, but I would like to definitely mention their names over here. Uh, Dr. Pandit Chavan, who also helped us record the various sessions. Uh, we have with, uh, we also had Nilesh Hume as the coordinator of one of the groups. Uh, then we also had a very young and dynamic uh, professor uh, and teacher, Raj Birje. Dr. Sudhir Mungre, sir was also a coordinator of one of the groups. Uh, then uh, Dr. Umesh Kumar Bagal. We also had with us Savita Chavan as the coordinator. We had a very, very dynamic friend with us, uh, Ramesh, uh, Rameshwar Solanke. And 
a young uh, and very very energetic person who also coordinated with the group uh, of uh, paper presenters group number 8 and it was sachin naravde uh, pankaj patel handled group number 9 very very efficiently dr manisha suryavanshi dr jyoti and uh, vijay pawar were there to look after group number 10 we had with us young energetic Uh, dipti kakade with us handling group number 11 we also had a person who is very very techno savvy dr ram bhise with us to handle group number 12 we had kamla kar chavan and professor ashok chikte who handle group number 13 uh, all of them had done uh, has have done a very wonderful job then we had uh, dr rajiv kamre handling group number 14 we had shrikant dr shrikant chavan and dr narendra pathak uh handling group number 16 friends uh, the list is really very long we also have many friends who have directly indirectly help us in the success of the conference i would like to also mention the name of uh, uh dipti muzumdar one of our very uh, close friends and a research scholar and also another friend of ours dr birappa bede and the entire herso team without whose support you know even thinking of this event is not possible so right from selecting the song uh, the evening prayer song or uh, doing every bit of it as a family is what we always have in the team of herso or higher education and research society let me take this honor of putting on record my sincere gratitude to each and every one of you who has who have put in and burned the oil for making this conference a grand success so may i request uh, uh, all of you all one one uh, special incident i would like to mention the virtual world has really brought us very very close there are there, there are own uh, advantages of this virtual world one such thing happened in our conference yesterday we were very happy to see one of our paper presenters presenting the paper while in a public transport so you can just imagine how close the world has become so uh, uh, just would like to end on a note uh, of gratitude i would request all of you all to please stand up for the national anthem thank you so much once again thank you i request prakash
thank you thank you everyone thank you thank, thank you. you everyone thank, thank you. you to all the paper presenters and delegates once again thank you so much thank you thank you thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you very much it was pleasure being with you connected to you thank you so much for being with us thank you very much it was a great pleasure for me too तो निकाल चालू है ना हां अच्छा अच्छा चलो सक्सेसफुल चल प्रकाश यस हेलो प्रकाश यस मैम यस स्पेशल थैंक्स टू यू वंस अगेन हां मैडम थैंक यू थैंक यू मैडम कांग्रेचुलेशंस मैम थैंक यू सर थैंक यू कांग्रेचुलेशंस सर एंड मैडम एंड द टीम Congratulations to the entire team. It's a teamwork. Thank you so much. Madam, I just run the PPT because uh, uh, I think I think uh, YouTube uh, this thing has already stopped. No, no ma'am, I haven't. It's still live. Please stop. No, ma'am, it will take time because last session doesn't come then. Yeah, uploading takes time. No, no, no. Actually, I see both the things, na? Okay. थोड़े वे 